presents his Easy Does It Barbecue with your host, Dan McDonald, owner of Colorado Barbecue Outfitters. If you're ready to dig into some serious talk about all things barbecue, from the moo to the oink, grab a cold one and let's get down to business. Now, here's Dan McDonald. Hi, everyone. You're listening to the Easy Does It Barbecue Radio Show. My name is Dan McDonald. I'm the owner and operator of Colorado Barbecue Outfitters right here in Colorado Springs, located on the northeast corner of Vickers and Academy. Appreciate you tuning in today. Today's topic, we're going to talk about pulled pork, or really more appropriately, pork shoulder. What it is, how to cook it, and all the different ways you can eat it. Let's get started. Pork shoulders are, in my opinion, the absolute easiest meat to barbecue. The bottom line, folks, is you really just cook it as long as you can. It is truly the epitome of low and slow cooking. You can't really screw up a pork shoulder. As long as you cook it long enough, let that fat in there render and let that muscle tissue break down, it's going to pull apart. It's really just a matter of cooking it up to an internal temp of about 200 degrees and then it's ready to go. Now, yes, you can prepare it many different ways, and I'll talk about some of those ways today on the show. Let's first start talking about what what a pork shoulder is, because you hear different uh, names for this cut of meat. So, obviously, pork, it comes from the pig. You're bringing not only home the bacon, but the whole gas darn pig. Where the pork shoulder's located is on the front feet, or front legs of the pig, if you will. There's actually two pork shoulder cuts of meat, and sometimes they get confused, and let's talk about the difference of them. On the upper part, up towards the spine, is the more commonly used pork butt. Pork shoulder, some people call it the Boston butt. Some people have different names for it, and that's the most common piece of meat that I'm gonna talk about in today's show. Now, right below it, down on the leg, is what's usually called the picnic shoulder. So what's the difference between the two? Well, the pork shoulder or the Boston butt or the pork butt that I'm emphasizing today, the one that's higher up towards the spine, it has quite a bit of fat content. Uh, It's a little more uh, tastier, in my opinion, than the true pork shoulder. It comes in a square or a rectangle. So the butchers generally, when they take it off the hog, usually cut it in a square. Now the perfect shape for meat to cook when heat is subjected to it is really a ball. The reason being is because when you have a sphere or a ball and the meat is subjected ambiently from the outside, it's gonna hit every part of that meat equally. Now, we don't normally have perfect spheres or balls. As I said, the pork shoulder or the Boston butt comes off the pig more in sort of a square shape. And it just provides for more even cooking and and a little bit more uh, consistent time cooking. Now, the picnic shoulder, which sits below the pork shoulder, it looks, if you held it up, it looks like a tornado or a funnel. It's wider at the top, and then, it, of course, it tapers down thinner as you get towards the hoof of the uh, of the pig. Now, typically, the picnic shoulder has skin on it, so it usually comes with that, and that's something you have to deal with. Most of the time, and I would say probably as high as 99% of the time, if you're going to a local grocery store, unless it's a specialty store, but your regular grocery stores that are out there, of the time you are buying what's called a Boston butt or again a pork butt, pork shoulder. That is the most common cut of meat that is sold um, and is widely available. The picnic roast or the picnic shoulder, the part that's below it, it, tends to be more uncommon. It will cook just like a pork shoulder or pork butt, but You have to remove the skin, uh, unless you're making cracklings or something like that. It's just more of the meat you're gonna cut off and get rid of. It's just not a very popular cut of meat unless uh, you are a restaurant or you're making carnitas. Those are a very popular source that come from the picnic. So a lot of you are listening right now and going, well, wait a minute, Dan, why is it called the butt if it's from the shoulder? All it is is a bunch of pork. 
It's a great question. There's a couple different theories. I have my own that I think is the most popular. And what that is, is a couple hundred years ago in Boston, pork was a huge commodity. During the colonial times, uh, pork was being raised just rampantly throughout what is now Massachusetts area. And what they did is they stuffed them, they salted them for preservation and stuffed them in a wooden crate that was called a butt. And I think the name stuck, pork butt, or hence Boston butt. But it does not come from the rear end of the pig, regardless of the name. It is the shoulder again. Some people say that the reason it's called a Boston butt or a pork butt is a butt is also another name for a joint or a joining of two things when you butt something together. And it just so happens that the Boston butt or the pork butt comes from that higher end of the shoulder where it joins technically with the spine. Either theory could be right. Like I say, I think it's the wooden crates that they packed them in called butts and the name just sort of stuck. And so you'll hear it referred to all of those. The pork butt, and again, I'm talking about that Boston butt from here on out, the pork butt, it's fattier, which in turn gives it more flavor. Uh, that fat renders quite a bit while you're cooking. It's a better uniform shape, and I just explained why that's important. But again, I would recommend that you get the, the pork butt, and that's probably what you're gonna find. It's gonna, unless you go to a butcher, it's gonna be difficult probably to find an actual picnic roast or picnic shoulder. The pork butt can come two ways, boneless or bone in. The bone that's in there is quite simply the shoulder blade. It is a fairly flat, larger size bone, Yes, you are paying for that when you are paying by the pound. However, the good news is, is pork shoulders are relatively cheap, folks. The typical going rate can be about $2.99 a pound. I'll be honest with you, I've never paid that much for a pork shoulder. Usually you can find them, the average cost in most grocery stores is about $2.49 a pound. And if you look carefully and keep an eye on your meat pricing here in town, they can go down as low as 99 cents a pound. But when they hit 99 cents a pound, you better get there before I do, because I've got a big freezer and I tend to buy them up, because that's a heck of a deal. The other beautiful thing about pork shoulders is not only are they fairly easy to find, fairly cheap, they're easy to cook, as you're gonna find out here, and they serve a lot. So when you cook a pork shoulder, you tear it apart, called pulled pork, and it'll feed a lot of people. It's easy to do. There's no carving. There's no other prep work. You just simply pull it apart, throw it in a pan, and let people dig into it. It is a myth that the bone or the shoulder blade in there really adds any flavor or anything else. I do think that it helps with heat distribution throughout the meat. I do think that it it's not like a microwave where it cooks the inside out, but the bone can heat up during cooking and will help get your pork shoulder done a little quicker, in my opinion. Again, it is a myth that it adds any flavor. It does not really add any flavor to the meat. Um, you can actually take it out if you want to carve it out, but that is quite a bit of a hassle. I would just leave the bone in and, and go from there. Now, if you like to do boneless, that's perfectly fine, too. Uh, neither one, I think, ultimately is the end result is going to be better than the other. I think it's just a matter of personal preference. I happen to like bone in. It's easy to find. Yes, I am pulling that bone out and I'm throwing it away, but I do think there's benefits during the cook from it. And that's just my own opinion. As I mentioned, the butt is has lots of fat and connective tissue. Years ago, people didn't want to buy it because when you the presentation in the grocery store, people thought, well, it's too fatty. Um, I like something that's leaner, things like that. But when it comes to pork shoulder, we don't want lean. We want a lot of fat. I mentioned that this is the easiest meat, in my opinion. During our poultry show, you remember I said that was the hardest meat. And I pointed out why, because it had two different types of meat. It had skin on, there was other things like that. The pork shoulder is just the opposite. It is so simply easy. All you have to do is subject it to heat for a long period of time. You can cook a pork shoulder in your smoker, which is what I prefer to do because I think the smoke adds flavor to the meat and I really like that. You can cook a pork shoulder in a crock pot. You can do it in your oven. Uh, any type of 
heat source will cook that shoulder, it's just going to take quite a long time to do. It's usually cooked whole. Most of the time, you, when you get the pork shoulder, they'll be anywhere from about four to 10 pounds. Uh, you won't see too many more over about the 10 pound range because that would be an astronomically large pig if you did. I'm not saying it's not out there, but most of the time you're gonna find them in your larger grocery stores around the seven to eight pound range. That's usually what I find. One of the things I wanted to mention is where to buy it. One of the questions I get in the store all the time from my customers is, where's the best place in town to buy meat? I always preface this by saying, for the money, those three words, this is not anything against butchers or any of the big box stores whatsoever. But for the money, I have found good meat for decent prices at what I call the membership clubs. That's your Costco's and Sam's. There are some restaurant supply places such as Shamrock, which is a restaurant food uh, located at uh, Galley and Academy. Um, they have pretty good price on their, their meat as well. You have the grocery stores, which is gonna be like your Safeways and King Supers and Walmarts. And those tend to be hit or miss. I've had good luck with them and not so much on some occasions. Again, no, nothing against those stores whatsoever. Now, obviously your really prime cuts are gonna be from the local butchers here in town. We have the benefit of having several here uh, located in Colorado Springs. The only issue is folks is you're gonna pay for that high quality. The butchers have the best meat in town and therefore they're gonna charge a higher amount for that. If you're fortunate enough that you can do it, then the butchers are gonna be your best place to get it. For the average middle American, I would say probably the Costco's or Sam's really work well as far as a decent price per pound in those. The only issue with them is you may have to buy it in a two pack. So oftentimes they'll come two pork shoulders in a pack one might be seven pounds, one might be eight, one might be a little smaller, one might be a little bigger. What I do, and I've preached this product a number of times, is I vacuum seal. So what I'll do is I'll buy that two pack because it's a better deal. I'll take it home, I'll wrap one in cellophane and throw it in the refrigerator because that's the one I'm gonna cook uh, either that day or the next day. And then the other one, I'll vacuum seal it and throw it in the freezer. If you don't have a vacuum sealer, go out and get one, folks. I'm telling you, this is one of the best products ever invented. The reason it is, for about $100, $150 or so, it will seal, obviously it'll vacuum all the air out and it will sear, seal your leftovers, or in this case, meat that you're just not gonna eat anytime soon, and you can throw it in the freezer. It'll last three years without getting freezer burnt. You'll never throw leftovers away for your family. You'll vacuum seal them, mark what they are, throw them in the freezer, and that's a meal for later on. When I do barbecue, I tell people I don't have time to barbecue every day. Sometimes I don't have time to barbecue every week. What I'll do is load up my, bar my smoker or my grill or what have you with as much meat as I can fit on there, cook it, vacuum seal it in meal size portions and throw it in the freezer and I'm good to go for months. So again, a vacuum sealer is a wonderful uh, product that you can pick up and it's really gonna help you with leftovers and especially if you buy in, in big quantities of meat at some of those membership clubs. Meal planning, and what I mean by that is another question I get is, Dan, how much pulled pork should I make for a group of people? Should I get two pork shoulders for my party? Should I get one? Should I get four? How many should I get? Well, the general rule, folks, is first of all, when you cook a pork shoulder, I told you it has a lot of fat and a lot of that fat will render, sometimes render as much as 50% of the size of the shoulder. So if you smoke that thing for, let's say 10 to 12 hours, and it's subjected to heat that long, a lot of that fat is going to render. I would say the average is about 30 to 40%. So if you're starting with an eight pound pork shoulder or Boston butt, you can do the math on that and figure that if it's gonna render down 30%, that's what you're gonna end up with in, in, in weight. The general rule is uh, about six ounces of meat 
per sandwich if you're making pulled pork sandwiches. I generally go one pound per person raw. So if I'm going to have 10 people at my party, obviously an eight pound uh, pork shoulder may not be enough. I'm a couple pounds shy. So uh, my rule is always make more than you need. It's better to have leftovers than not enough. The leftovers, once again, I just mentioned, can be vacuum sealed or just thrown in the fridge and eaten the next day. So again, it's always better to be a little over than it is to be under. The great thing about pork shoulders is there is probably 50 different ways and they're all correct on how to prepare it. Remember, the theme here on the Easy Does It Barbecue Radio Show is the easiest way to do it. So that's what I'm going to tell you how to do today. And then you can branch out from there. You can wet brine a pork shoulder. It's not very common, but you can. You can dry brine it. That's the most common method I'll talk about today. You can inject it with anything you want, any kind of liquid you think would taste good. Um, I don't always do that necessarily because I think pork shoulders, again, do have enough connective tissue and fat to provide enough flavor on its own. And not to mention, I'm the laziest barbecuer you'll ever meet, and I'm very proud of that. I like to do, I like to cook good meat with as little effort as possible and enjoy it. You can sauce it up. You can put barbecue sauce on it. Here's your easy does it barbecue IQ. Now, when we talk about barbecue sauce, remember we have a lot of regional flavors throughout our country. One of the places that really highlights pork is in the Carolinas. Texas is known for its beef, its beef ribs and its brisket. That is what Texas has virtually perfected down there. The Carolinas have pretty much perfected pork. Then you've got the KC style, which is everything. In Kansas City, they'll barbecue roadkill if you give them a chance. But in the Carolinas, they have regions within the Carolinas themselves. So they have two types of sauces they'll use. They will use a vinegar-based sauce that they are very happy with down there, or a tomato-based sauce, which is something that more of the other regions will do. Carolina throws in a third one though, a mustard-based sauce. And there's something about mustard-based sauces as well as the vinegar that seems to just go really well with pork. The flavor combos that most people choose when they are flavoring their pork, whether it's the dry brine before or rub or after with sauce tends to go a sweet profile. Now guys, this is not a hard, fast rule, obviously. Nothing is really in food as long as you keep it safe. It's really up to your palate and your family's palate and what you think will be good. So experimentation is a lot of fun. The beautiful thing about pork shoulders is they are relatively cheap and you don't have to be afraid to experiment with them and try different ways and watch different YouTube videos and give it a try. Goodness knows I've tried just about all of them myself and I keep coming back to just the most basic way of doing it. So let's talk about what that basic way is. Real quickly before we do that, I'm gonna cover a question that's very often asked of me and I realize why it's asked. Unfortunately, I can never answer this question correctly. Let me explain why. The question is, Dan, how long does it take to cook a pork shoulder or to smoke a pork shoulder? So when I say cook, I'm gonna use that, that um, generically because you can put it in the oven. You can put it in the smoker. Uh, you can put it in your crock pot. All of those are very popular ways to do it. Obviously, I choose the smoker because I like the flavor that's infused by the smoke, hence barbecuing. You can actually cheat. And I know my purest listeners are gonna cringe when I say this, but there are a lot of people that will uh, infuse liquid smoke into the pork shoulder. Some of them will make a little bit of a liquid smoke type of um, uh, au jus and put it in the crock pot with it. Uh, most of us hardcore barbecuers would call that cheating, but I don't know that there is such a thing. If you like smoke flavor, how you get it's up to you. All right, let's get into how to do pulled pork. Here's what we do and I'm gonna run through it um, uh, ra rather quickly. If you need clarification, please come in to Colorado Barbecue Outfitters. We're there Tuesday through Saturday, 10 to 6, and Sunday, 11 to 4, and we can answer all of your questions about that. 
when you get a pork shoulder, first thing is I don't trim it. I leave all the fat on it. The fat's either going to get trimmed off before or it's going to get pulled out after. Uh, I would rather it get pulled out after because I think the fat does add flavor and it does render down and create some great juices in there. I'm going to put a dry rub on it. I've already explained in previous shows what a dry rub does to the meat. Um, it basically moisturizes. I'm going to wrap it in cellophane. I'm going to leave it in the fridge at least eight hours or overnight. I'm going to put that pork shoulder on the smoker. I'm going to fire the smoker up to anywhere from 180 to 250. I choose about 225 when I do it. Most people will use a sweet wood like an apple or a fruit wood blend or some cherry or something of that effect. But again, when it comes to smoking, folks, you can use any wood you like. There's no rule on that. I do like a sweet wood when I do my pork shoulders, though. I tend to use apple. Apple is just a wood that I, for those of you that know me, know that I use it quite a bit. After you uh, leave it in the fridge overnight with the rub and cellophane, throw it on the smoker. Just set it right on there. You've got the rub on there. You can even add more rub. Smoke it to an internal temp of 160 or the stall. I know a lot of you are going, well, Dan, again, how long will that take? Well, tying back to that time frame, a generic rule is one hour and 15 minutes per pound. But folks, please understand that that is just a guideline. Don't come into the store after you've done that and said, Dan, I bought a six pound pork shoulder and it took twice as long. It could happen, guys, and I know that's frustrating, but it's always better to get done earlier than later because you can always rewarm it. But just figure one hour, 15 minutes per pound is a great guideline to start with. The more you cook, the more you're going to get into a groove of how long it takes. All right, so we've got it on the smoker. We've got it going. We've got our digital temperature probe in there. Remember, we want digital thermometers. You can pick those up at the store in our meat to track the exact temp of the of, of internal. When we're playing around with pork, we got to make sure that it gets to the right temp. Now with pork, a safe temp is 145, but that doesn't cut it on a pork shoulder. You have to get that pork shoulder up to 195, 200 for it to be able to render and pull apart. So we're smoked it to an internal temp of 160. Generally at that point, we're going to wrap it. It's called a Texas crutch, and I've explained what that is in previous shows. It just simply means you're going to double wrap it in foil. Now, folks, if we're not in the heat of the summer like we are at this point, most of the time I'll take it off the smoker and just finish it in the oven. My oven's more efficient cooking inside. My oven can, can hold its temp without me having to worry about it. Um, it's very easy to do. However, in the heat of summer, none of us wants to put our oven on. The whole point of having a smoker outside is to get that heat outside and out of your house. So on my smoker, whether it's my charcoal smoker or wood pellet grill or what have you, I double wrap it in foil. If you want to add an injection, if you want to add more rub, if you want to do pour a little apple juice in there, you can do whatever your heart desires. It's entirely up to you. Experiment, play around, figure out what you like to do. After I double wrap it in foil, I will tend to turn the heat up about 50 degrees. I only do that, folks, to get it done quicker. <laughs> That's all. Uh, you can leave it at the temperature that you're at. I usually smoke around 225, so that means I'm going to turn my smoker up or wood pellet grill up to 275. Now, if you're using a charcoal smoker or an electric smoker, do not add any more wood at this point. Once you've double wrapped that meat in foil, it's not going to smoke anymore. Now you're just roasting it. Now we're going to cook it to an internal temp of 200. It's that simple. You just let it go. It could take two hours. It could take five more hours. All the cuts of meat are different. Once it's hit 200, so in the case of not in the heat of summer and I'm finishing it in the oven, once it hits 200, I'll just turn the oven off and I don't even open that door. I will leave that wrapped pork shoulder in that oven as long as I can. Folks, I did a test one time where I cooked a pork shoulder to 200 internal temp. I turned my oven off. I left it in there with the lid closed. After two hours, I came and still checked the temp, and it wasn't even under 190 at that point, which is way too hot for my hands to touch. 
So I left it in there another two hours. After four hours, it was still too hot to touch. So you don't have to worry about leaving it in there wrapped in the foil. It's going to stay hot for quite a while. A caterer's trick is to take it out, wrap it in a towel, and then stick it in a cooler. Now they're doing that because they're porting it to another location generally. I just leave it in my oven because my oven's as insulated as a cooler. But if you try that, again, the moral of the story here is be done earlier than later. You can always keep it warm. You can reheat it, whatever you want. But it's not fun eating at 11 o'clock at night if you've planned incorrectly. After it's gotten to the point where you're ready to unwrap it out of the foil, be careful. It'll be hot probably unless you've really let it set for a while. Insulated food gloves are something that you really need to have. I sell them at the store. Come by and see me, and I'll show you a couple different ways to be able to take care of that. What a lot of the quote-unquote pros use that you see on YouTube because it gives them more dexterity is they have cotton liners, and I also have these at Colorado Barbecue Outfitters. You have cotton liners, and they have nitrile food-grade gloves over the top. So the nitrile keeps the cotton liners from getting all messy, the cotton liners keep your hands from burning. Also, those give you better dexterity to pull the pork, to carve, whatever you want to do. So after we've opened it up from the foil and we've pulled it, it's ready to eat, folks. At that point in time, it's that simple. So again, the entire process is smoke it to an internal temp of 160 or maybe the stall if you hit that. We've talked about that in previous shows. Wrap it, double wrap it in foil, put it under a heat source, whether that's still on your smoker, on your grill, in your electric oven, in a crock pot. I know some people will smoke the pork shoulder and then they will put it in a crock pot and then they will cook it for several hours then and then pull it. So you can even use multiple uh, cooking sources for your pulled pork as well. There are tons and tons of things to do with pulled pork. It's a very versatile type of meat once you get done cooking it. Obviously, the most popular is pulled pork sandwiches. That can be simply putting the pulled pork on a bun, putting a little barbecue sauce, and eating away. You can add cheese if you want. There's nothing wrong with that. Some people just eat it plain. Um, one of the recipes that I like and get on the internet and, and look, do an internet search for this is called creamy pulled pork taquitos. I have that recipe at the store. Come in and see me and I can give you a copy of it. But that is one of the most outstanding uses of pulled pork that I personally have ever found. You can make pulled pork tacos, pulled pork burritos. You can chop the pulled pork up, put it in your omelets basically anything you could think of to put it in. Pulled pork chili, you name it. If you get tired of eating the pulled pork sandwiches, put it into another dish. It's wonderful uh, to eat. But again, pork shoulders are relatively cheap. They're very hard to mess up. You almost virtually cannot screw these up, folks. And they have many, many uh, leftover uses. It's a very popular item for catering businesses and barbecue restaurants to carry for that very reason. It's very easy for you to do the exact same thing at home. And that's all, folks. All right, everybody, that's our show on pulled pork. Thanks for listening. Once again, come into Colorado Barbecue Outfitters at 5921 North Academy Boulevard, or you can go to our website at 719bbq.com. You can reach out to me on all forms of social media. We look forward to any topics you'd like to hear about in the future, as well as any questions on this week's show. Thanks for listening, everyone. And remember, if it ain't easy, you're working too hard. Take care. Thanks for listening to Easy Does It Barbecue, brought to you by Colorado Barbecue Outfitters, specializing in pellet grills, charcoal grills, electric smokers, sauces, rubs, and barbecue accessories. Online at 719BBQ.com. See you next Saturday at 1 for Easy Does It Barbecue. And listen to the podcast on Podbean.